space communications. These will be among the main topics for dialogue. In the midst of climate change, we need to think about reconnecting on a much bigger scale with natural systems. And there are still so many of these technologies out there that, you know, for our legacy of biases and a lack of understanding, we're still ignoring. Hey Julia, how are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. So Julia, you're in New York. Um, how have things been in recent times, the recent unrest um, with the lockdown and things, various things that are happening in the States? How, how have you been? Yeah, we have been pretty good considering. We're in Fort Greene in Brooklyn and so this was literally ground zero for the protests and it's kind of it, it was it, it was pretty awkward at the very beginning of COVID with the you know everybody off the streets and you know it was really quiet I had a really strange feeling but I feel like almost the protests were this moment of everyone breaking free out of that and people were just so frustrated and it all just came out so it was pretty amazing and incredible and they're still going on which is um, fantastic. But uh, we have been, we've been kind of lying pretty low. Um, but it, it's, I feel like New York is pretty proud of themselves now because we've come out of this better than the rest of the country is faring now. That's good to hear. And, and, and yeah. by and large, have the protests been relatively peaceful? I mean, I see a little bit on the news. I mean, I'm not really watching the news as much these days, but it was it looked pretty bad at, you know, early on. Is things a, bit, a lot more peaceful now? Is there conversations being had and progress being made? Yeah, definitely here. Uh, I mean, the beginning, you know, there was the, when the, there was the, like the, the police van that was lit on fire that was literally at the end of our street right here. Um, so it's hectic, but it's, you know, I think that there is a lot of raging and now there's a little bit more, you know, community and communication and people here at least um, doesn't seem to be that sort of, you know, spark and rivalry um, with the police and the protesters anymore. It's, it's pretty damn peaceful and there's just so much support for the protests. Protesters just in the general community that everyone is behind them around in this neighborhood. That's great to hear. Yeah, let's hope that this brings on some positive change. You know, the whole lockdown and this unrest. Let's hope that it's uh, it's given us all a bit of an awakening and we can sort of progress yeah. and move forward as a society and ultimately ecologically, yeah. you know. So, yeah, I think the future yeah. will be bright. Um, so, Julia, congratulations, by the way, on your book, Low Tech. It's uh, really amazing. Um, it looks Thanks. amazing. And what the content inside there is just incredible. And uh, so you're an architect. Um, you've obviously done extensive research into indigenous peoples, cultures, and their systems. Where did this journey start in terms of your explorations and these types of studies to these often pretty remote places and communities? Where did it all begin? Um, yeah, it, it began about 10 years ago when I was teaching a course at Columbia University here in the city. And I started teaching all this high-tech stuff, which is what we design when we're talking about sustainability. But there was also what I was interested in, which is looking at how indigenous and local communities develop a really different type of relationship with nature. So I, I started exploring some different landscapes around the world, went on a couple of pilgrimages, and one of them was to Tibet. Um, made a short documentary about a sacred mountain in Tibet. And actually, a uh, scientist who was working in Bali he contacted me after seeing the documentary and he had just uh, written this dossier to get Bali's first UNESCO World Heritage Site listed. And he got on the phone to me and asked me whether I could come and help him design a tourism management plan 
for that particular project. So I actually kind of started right where you are. Incredible. So, so you've spent some time in Bali then? Yeah, a while ago, five years ago. Um, but more than just spending time there, I think I was like talking to a lot of scientists and members of the Subak community there and just had this whole incredible kind of like deep dive education about the sacred landscape and about the Subak community and, and how the whole system works. And that's actually a chapter in the book. And then I was actually recently there again for New Year's Eve and I was at Potato Head and saw Harvey play and Peggy Goo and yeah, so I've been back a while ago and then back more recently. Great. And um, what wisdom do you think we can learn um, from these indigenous cultures that we may have lost in modern times? Obviously, there's big threats happening in the world now. If you look, look at some of the recent studies, the ecological disaster is looming. It's, it's, a, it's, it's real, you know, it's happening. And in your book and some of those talks I've heard you, um, uh, what I've heard you uh, online, there's definitely a lot of wisdom which I feel is still really very relevant in today's world that maybe is being lost, or maybe we, even we can um, look deeper into using new technology. Do you think there is a lot of wisdom there that we can maybe look back at in terms of using it in today's world? Yeah, and it's actually that was one of the questions way way back when I was first thinking about all of this was you know what. What are those relationships with nature and and what is the wisdom that we are in what that you know in western world what are we missing like what have we lost what are we ignoring what have we overlooked and you know just thinking about bali and that there's one concept like taking mythology and thinking about what are the rela relationships in mythology that we can apply to design or apply to sustainable thinking that's kind of like a really big part of what traditional ecological knowledge is, or TEK, which is the name of the book. And for Bali, they have, um, the, the Subak believe in this concept called the Trihita Karana. It's, and and there's in, within that, this tripartite division of the island, like the mountains and, and the heavens, the middle ground, and then the sea. And you would normally think that one is sort of good and one is bad and one is higher and one is lower, but in that concept, each are relevant to each other. So the sacred landscapes and the underworld, which is the sea, there they don't exist without one another. And it's really important because actually is, you know, a closed loop system because you understand that the waste that comes from the middle ground goes into the sea and it gets recycled back into the water for the mountains. So that whole big concept of like a closed loop and of sort of regeneration that's kind of the thinking, that's the base of resilience thinking and that's the base of the thinking that I think we don't discuss or, or think about when we think about technology these days and that's just what these traditional ecological systems are based on. And so a big discussion in the book I talk about is this mythology of technology and that's this idea that we have in the 21st century that there's a really small set of technologies that are mostly digital, mostly high tech, and they were they were decided, you know, in the period of the Enlightenment 400 years ago by a you know, bunch of white guys in Europe, and they were like, okay, this is technology, this is what we see, and this is what we're going to say is technology, and most of that wasn't nature-based technology, it was, you know, that idea of distance from of humans from nature, and so now we're at this point where, you know, we, we, we've, we're in the midst of climate change, we need to think about reconnecting on a much bigger scale with natural systems and there are still so many of these technologies out there that you know for our legacy of biases and a lack of understanding we're still ignoring so if we can sort of rewrite that mythology of what we currently think of it as, as technology and think about the potential of what technology could become to bring us back into alignment with the earth that's kind of like the big learning that I think can come, can come from this work. Yeah, I mean, in modern technology, it seems to be very good in the short term and very bad yeah. in, the long, in the long term. So whether that's, you know, different digital things, it's very good at communicating, you know, makes communications easier and it has a lot of benefits, but then all of a sudden people start getting sick from it or it's very, yeah. you know, extremely bad for the environment. So they tend to be very short-lived technological advancements and when you look back at the technologies of the these indigenous um, peoples and cultures that you're 
studying, there's such a sort of long term view on how they're how they're sort of planning and building and making things. And as you said, it is all interconnected with nature. It's nature's systems. It's circularity. It's re regenerates, and it's all those sort of things that we need in in today's world. Um, do you think that in the current sort of climate of you know COVID lockdown, I'm seeing a sort of sh shift in consciousness in terms of there's a lot more people now who are really feeling the fragility of what it means to be human again. And I, and I hope that there's a bit of a wake up and maybe now we can really look at these types of systems again, you know, using new technology, but still looking at the, at the sort of circular systems that nature provided us. Are you seeing any sort of like pr sort of within the lockdown or, or moving forward? Do you think that this sort of current trend of people looking into more sustainable practices will actually gather more pace and become something which we can actually seriously implement on a large scale? Are you seeing any changes or have you seen anything that might indicate we're ready to make a bit of a shift? Yeah, I mean, it's funny because digital technologies like the ones we're talking about or like the ones which we currently, you know, view as technologies, they kind of, they weren't developed in the same way that these nature-based technologies were developed, nor in the same type of circumstances which we find ourselves today, which are living on... A fi living on a finite planet with finite resources and um, levels of scarcity and really understanding that we can't just keep on going faster and and consuming more and and uh, taking in more resources while at the same time polluting and doing all those things that don't really understand that you know the circular the closed loop system so you know, technologies, we see it even, you know, digital technologies, they're always made from infinite amount of resources. They never have a, sort of an end goal in mind. Most of the time they're like, we want to do good. But you see now Facebook might have been something that was for social uh, meetings and relationships, but it's really transformed and morphed into something completely different. And I mean, just here in the US, all these uh, congressional hearings with the leaders of these huge tech companies to really figure out if we're at a point where tech is sort of somewhat misleading us because there are no restraints and there's no ethics or moral codes to sort of guide these these really large corporations and how they're interacting and how they're influencing society. Um, but sort of in contrast to that, these nature-based technologies, they were born out of scarcity, they're born out of need, they're born out of an understanding that there are environmental extremes, that you can't, you know, um, you can't destroy your water because you're eventually, you're going to have to drink it again, you know, you have to protect your resources and you're also sharing those resources with people downstream, um, other animals, or, you know, other spaces and so there's this sort of completely different understanding so it's hard to it, it's understandable to see that digital technologies and the nature-based technologies, they ended up very differently in very different playing fields. What I'm seeing now, and I'm talking with some of these, some of these companies, is there is a huge interest and in understanding that in the future, dollar is going to equal sustainability. And without including this idea of sustainability in these large portfolios, um, and without introducing the really real understanding of climate risk to how companies are growing and, and being able to be incredibly adaptable and resilient faced with unknown circumstances, those companies are probably not going to be able to withstand some of the forces, whether they're economic, political, you know, um, supply chains that they're going to face. So they have to think, think about these types of understandings and resilience thinking and systems thinking and, you know, I think that it's going to be well served that some of these, you know, speaking to some of these big uh, technology companies, they're really interested in actually saying, well, how can we do better? And they're looking at themselves and wanting to figure that out. Um, what's going to need to happen is like, you know, high level systemic change and thinking to really implement those uh, changes now so that in like 10 15 years the cascading effect of those changes will totally transform how those um, 
digital corporations actually have an engagement with the environment and understand natural systems and can be adaptable and resilient. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, the, the companies I talk to, everybody does want to make a change, you know, whether they're generally interested in it or not and passionate about it or not. I think they just understand now that the, the consumer, the younger, you know, the Gen Z, progressive Gen Zs that are coming through, yeah. it's just going to be a standard that demand that they expect brands to follow these types of values. So I think everybody yeah. is looking at it, they're interested, they want to make the change, but they just don't know quite how to do that as yet. I, I don't know, is, is that something that you that you do within your practice? Do you kind of go in and consult with companies and, and sort of, you know, teach them of some of the systems that you've been um, studying? Is that something that you offer? Yeah, it's something that has come up recently and something that was really unexpected, actually, as a, a sort of a, a um, client base that's just really quickly evolved and it's um, tech companies, um, companies that are probably more on board with sustainable thinking, property companies that have like global property portfolios that are really interested in understanding um, how they can contribute and I think there's some kind of also alliance with people, a genuine interest but also want to be seen as considering these, um, these shifts and these moves and somehow it kind of became, um, I think it went from like environmentalism being kind of like not so cool to now it's like really, you know, something that you want to, want to identify with and, and think about. So it's kind of transformed and its identity as well, which is great. Um, and fashion as well. There's a lot of companies who are doing pretty uh, hu huge sort of fashion dis distribution and branding and identity which they're really interested in. They understand the power of storytelling in fashion and they want to start um, bringing the idea of sustainability on board and, and talking about that to their, um, to their clientele. So it's been great and really interesting. We'll see how it all goes. Um, but it's super exciting that there's that level of interest. No, it's great. I mean, what a, what a fantastic trend, you know, to, um, to emerge that everybody wants to try and actually do something positive for the planet, you know? which yeah. is um which is fantastic i mean you mentioned the fashion industry yeah. that's that's an industry where i come from i've kind of worked in fashion since i was 16 founded my own store in london as well and and, and kind of worked with many brands over the years and just became disillusioned by it you know probably about 10 years ago now when i thought i was living the dream you know i had my own store in london and buying all the brands under buying collaborating with people and and at that person that that sort of time i was also just personally growing i was growing up and just becoming a lot more conscious. And I kind of was doing, I was wondering why I was kind of thought I was living my dream, yet I was feeling very unfulfilled. And as I started sort of looking deeper into what I was doing in my life, and then I realized, well, actually the work I'm doing is not really giving me that sort of satisfaction. And, and, I, and as I sort of done more research into it, it was kind of like, well, you know, I'm buying all of this stuff, half of it's not selling, buying more stuff. And you just, it's just this constant sort of thing of just buying things that no one really wants, but you're kind of f almost forcing it on people. And then learning that the fashion industry is the second worst polluter, second worst polluting yeah. industry in the world behind oil and gas, which is pretty, pretty bad. It's the, the waste that's generated is just phenomenal. And yet fashion is supposed to be the most, one of the most progressive industries out there in terms of looking forward and, you know, breaking the status quo and all those sort of things. So I think now is the time definitely for fashion brands to make that change. And I, and I believe that if they don't, then no one's going to be buying their, their products in the next 10 years. I think it's just like they're, they're going to have to change if they want to keep, keep, uh, keep progressing and keep moving on as a brand. So, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's a good time and it's great that people are starting to wake up to this. And uh, the more people yeah. that are talking about it, you know, people like yourself who've gone out there and studied things and you've got a lot of knowledge t to share, I think it's a great thing, you know. Yeah, and I think the power of fashion is that which is different to like what I'm generally talking about and and teaching with the built environment is that the built environment is a little bit more removed and from the from the individual and from the individual's identity and also like you know what you spend your money on from your pocket um, and what that means to you kind of personally every day but the fashion industry is so directly uh, mixed up in all those really seriously personal exchanges and I think that people sort of taking back the power of you know where they spend their money who they want to wear and and making companies accountable 
it's because that's their that's their personal way of of interacting and, and engaging this topic and that's really really powerful and so i think that that realization of certain industry certain uh, companies in the industry the ones who are realizing that and then realizing what the hurdles they'll have to overcome to actually rectify their supply chains and their manufacturers and all that huge ecosystem um they'll be the ones who are, who are really advanced and, and ahead of the curve when everybody else kind of like starts to follow it and, and really take a look at themselves and, and figure out how they have to change as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I guess a lot of the indigenous cultures that you're visiting, it's obviously by nature, it's, it's all, everything is made locally, everything is made by hand, yeah. um, you know, based on the environment that they're in. And, you know, in modern times of globalization, you have these big brands who are, you know, they might actually only be producing in one place in the world, yet they're shipping it to, you know, however many hundreds of places in the world, and then often shipping it around the world several times with different distribution policies and, and whatever. So that, that, that seems to be a bit of an issue on an ecological sense. Um, however, I have seen recently there's a, there is a big move and a big shift sort of, of consumers, you know, looking back at local productions and, you know, the kind of di di deep, uh, digging deeper into the history of sort of the craft uh, culture that maybe came from that particular area. And we are seeing a bit more of a kind of local demand again. Um, do you feel that's something which we need to sort of look back at? I think obviously from a level of creativity, it's much more interesting to have things that are different in, in different territories or than the, the same cook, uh, cookie cutting stores everywhere. And obviously from an yeah. environmental perspective, it's much better for the environment and the economy. So is that something which you feel we could we we're seeing uh, a shift towards, or do you think that's something we we need to maybe look at a little bit deeper into of like going local again? I mean, I think we need to look much deeper into it. Um, I mean, you can see from like the food industry that that movement has been happening for a while, and the same type of thinking um, might happen in the fa fashion industry, like slow fashion, which is like so might be similar to like the slow food movement or I think the only, and, and really, you know, different back brands thinking about, I always call it like their material footprint um, or their ecological footprint. Like who are there, and being more intentional about, you know, if they want to work in a particular country or a particular region of a country, what are some of the issues that are there that perhaps by them inserting themselves into that community, could they do other things than just, you know, profit and extract because I think that there is, you know, if we want to get interested in local community and local cultures, sometimes there's this, especially with corporate big brands, there's this way that um, you can, it's called cultural extraction and you can, you can identify with something and then use it and then remove it without ever, re so that, that relationship of building up um, profit, building up economics, governance, schooling systems, health care, child care, when you interact with a particular community, community, if you're going to get their knowledge, their design skills, their practices, and that's going to sort of be for the better of your particular product, there has to be that kind of reckoning that those types of ways that we used to um, do business, they're not really appropriate anymore. So we really need to sort of figure out these new ways to do business if we are going to interact with these communities in other countries. And then that's going to be that really big first step is, you know, how does that, how does that make sense and how do, how do brands and companies really make that, you know, a top level priority? Yeah, I almost feel this, the big corporations, especially the other ones that generally, they seem to care the least in terms of they go in there you know, it's cheap labor, they do, do very little for the local communities, and then they quite often they're not paying any taxes in the country that they're producing. Yet, you know, companies of that scale, they could actually make considerable change. Yeah. They have they have the, you know, I mean, I've heard the, the, the word conscious capitalism being thrown around quite a bit, whereas, you know, they, they are making profits and they are making money, but how much good could they do with all of that profit rather than just sort of lining shareholders' pockets? And I feel it, it's an opportunity on both ends. It's an opportunity for those companies, and it's a fantastic opportunity for the local communities to actually um, share these um, knowledge, share the this sort of exchange, because it will create better products for the, the company. It will open up 
you know, new narratives, as you mentioned, that, that could be much more interesting from a brand perspective. And it'll just generally make them look better in terms of people will actually go, great, these, these guys are actually doing something positive and you might have a bit more of an emotional connection towards the brand. And I do yeah. feel like they're going to have to sort of do that. So I feel, do feel there is a bit of a unique opportunity that we're in at the moment where brands could look at this again and, you know, build up these, these, these levels of local craft, crafts people that exist in those territories. One thing actually, which, which I'm particularly interested in is, is looking at ancient materials, but then sort of bringing them into the modern world. So for example, um, we had Sital Solanke on the show a few weeks ago, and she's been working with a brand who takes waste coconuts and, and, and takes the, yeah. the, 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 the old water out of the coconut and then makes leather out of it. And then they're they're, yeah. they're making that locally in India, and they're supporting the economy there. And then it and then obviously it's it's much better for the environment as well. So they're the types of things which I feel are very interesting at the moment. And I, I wonder if there's anything that you've seen on your travels that we could maybe utilize in a much smarter way than what's currently being used at the moment. I mean, I think you know I I think there's a huge shift in terms of products to think about the sort of like the really big hot topic right now, and it's very relevant is plastic waste and like how do we rethink that and what do we you know how do we upcycle that how do we remove that from our landscapes what how do we stop the manufacturing of that but I know when you start to create these um, sort of more closed loop systems what has been found is that you know in terms of making products out of recycled plastic waste you'll find that these if there's a demand for a particular material, a supply chain might establish itself that actually, you know, is, you know, there is a water bottle factory that was in Nepal that never actually bottled the water. It just made the bottles that could then be sold to a factory that was recycling the plastic. So you get these inauthentic supply chains because there's this, you know, there's a, there's a supply chain that's needed. Um, so I'm a little bit, uh, you know, I, I realize the issue of plastics, but I think, you know, really, trying to think about what type of um, technologies are evolved locally and there are so many one of the technologies i'm really interested in is islanding technologies how do you sort of create floating islands that might community in my industry that communities might think that they will live on and we're starting to see that happening in the netherlands we're starting to see that happening that un habitat project but none of the technologies are really looking at indigenous technologies like islands that are made to float of which you know we've got a list of 64 different communities from around the world who live on floating islands who live with water um and no one's really looking at that yet and it's and it it's really interesting because most of the work that i look at i look at it like a a material technologist and then as a like an architect and then like an urban designer so i look at like super small scale chemical interactions you know how does this island stay afloat oh it's multiple processes of decomposition what are the materials doing and then how do they construct it and then what is it how does it interact with like the big ecosystem um, and for me i think that's kind of one of those areas of thinking about how to live with water as sea level rise and um, thinking about how do we not just sort of recycle that old idea of let's make something high tech, but mix, let's make it in this new way that looks like it's going to be sustainable when it's in fact it, it's not. It's just built out of the same materials that we build everything on land and it'll probably have the same ecological impact uh, uh, in the water as these other materials have on land, which aren't great. Um, so those are the more, more of the type of systems and the kind, kind of like thinking and methodology um, that I'm specifically interested in. Mm, and when you say floating islands, these are kind of artificially made yeah. floating islands? Yeah, so and it's interesting because if you look f back far enough, you can find them in Europe, in Italy and Germany and in China. And now you still find them in Africa, um, in parts of Asia, in the Middle East and in South America. And they're islands that small families, you know, up to 20 people will live on, but there are 50 of them. So this community is just living on these smaller islands that they're constructing themselves out of reeds that they find in the marshes that they live in. 
But what's even more interesting is these islands, they, they last for 25 years. So longer than the life cycle of some buildings, which is on average 10 years. And they're completely biodegradable. I mean, not everybody in all circumstances could live like that. But I think to your point, what's super interesting is when you start to think of hybridizing contemporary material technology, which some of, with some of those uh, more indigenous and local technologies and materials. And that's where I see like a new industry that's super exciting that kind of yet l hasn't been touched upon so much. And it's probably not going to be done by me, but I'm trying to like push other people to start thinking about it and plant those seeds of creativity in others. Absolutely, yeah. It's almost like the catalyst, you know, you're providing the ideas and, and, the, and the knowledge and then somebody else can jump on it and make it into a, a, a yeah, sort of viable yeah. thing. Yeah, It's interesting because we, we, we've looked into bamboo quite a bit and we had a Laura Hardy from Abuku and Green School on the show last week and she was saying something similar whereby bamboo typically was seen as something which was, you know, obviously a very ancient material and it wasn't very long lasting, so it may only last 10 years or something. But because they found out a way of, of treating the bamboo, it can now last up to 100 years. So I guess that's, yeah. a, that's something which maybe we can, that what you're talking about there is when you can find whether it's a, a treatment or maybe using a new way of, uh, a new process to make the material a bit more um, robust, then it could actually you know, extend the lifespan by set up to several times. So yeah, I guess that, that could be an interesting way of looking at it. And and these islands, then, do you do you feel obviously there's a there's a big um, ecological crisis looming, as I mentioned, and what and a few of the studies I've been reading saying that um, Southeast Asia in particular, a lot of it, I mean not all of it, but quite a bit of Southeast Asia will be underwater in 50 years, which is pretty catastrophic. Jakarta being one of them. I know you've you've studied or you've looked into Jakarta quite a bit, and that they're saying in 30 years a lot, a lot of that could be underwater. Um, obviously, I don't know how repairable that is. I mean, I don't have the, the that sort of information of saying, okay, we could if we do something now, we can actually stop it. If we can't stop it, it's too late. Do you feel these types of floating systems could be a viable option potentially to sort of create these huge floating cities that will be underwater rather than just sort of packing up and leaving and accepting it? Is that do you think there's something we can look at into with that? Yeah, I mean, I think that. What we have to understand, I think, with resilience thinking is that, yeah, we've got to plan for 50 years ahead, but in, you know, next year, people will still be living there in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years. So it's not going to, the likelihood of people packing up and moving somewhere completely different is probably not going to happen. So we've got to have those plans for transition. And as, as the sea level rise, how do we change and how do we adapt? And that's kind of like one of the main tenets of really smart, um, forward thinking resilience planning. And, you know, what Jakarta has been doing is uh, they turned around and like so many countries around the world, when they're getting these huge floods that are hundred year floods that are now coming every single year and the cities are being inundated they're turning to the West and asking for help. But the solutions that come from places like, uh, you know, uh, from the Dutch, they're probably not so applicable to the local ecosystems, the knowledge bases, you know, even, even the, the ability of what can be spent on the type of systems, the contemporary systems. And so there's kind of this, this discussion right now in my industry about the efficacy of bringing these these sort of very modern high tech higher tech contemporary systems from wealthier countries into countries that are developing that really will you know for to trade for getting those technologies there's foreign direct investment which means that these younger more developing countries will always sort of uh, oh these wealthier countries money so it's kind of this like weird economic relationship that's being established and what's being ignored especially in Jakarta is that there are systems where whether it's islanding or whether it's like intertidal agriculture systems that are around the corner and no one's lo even looking at how they could be adapted by designers using material contemporary construction techniques thinking about how to plan a regional urban area to, to, to be actually impacted 
by sea level rise and to still function, no one's really thinking about that. And they're like, you know, primary things that are needed by cities. There's food, water, transportation, but all those systems, they can be adapted and they have been adapted for thousands of years, but we haven't started looking at those models yet to think about, and even those, you know, regionally specific models to think about how different countries can do that each in their own different way that are completely applicable that people kind of already know how to build. So it's kind of like, it seems really obvious because it's kind of in front of people's faces, but it's not obvious because uh, people really aren't considering it because they consider all these systems primitive and, you know, they've been, a lot of people around the world have been sold the idea that, you know, Western, Western technologies are better for some reason. But I think we're realizing now that the Western technologies got us here in the first place. So we need to look broader and we need to open our eyes wider and really think smarter and design better to figure out how we're going to, you know, do things like not be 95% underwater by the year 2050, like the predictions for Jakarta are. And then be, you know, billions of dollars in debt to another country to try and figure out, you know, how to protect or fortify the cities from inundation from water. Mm, yeah, it's unbelievable, isn't it? I mean, you know, these these new technologies, they might last five years and then they realize they don't work. And then quite often that there's the investment level of investment is so huge. And quite often yeah. it'll be irreversible because if they start building these huge, big concrete, I mean, I don't know what they're planning, but I assume it will be something, a large type of construction, which will, will be by yeah. and large kind of irreversible to any ex to some extent. So. Yeah, I, I feel like, you know, even if we if they do consider these indigenous um, practices kind of out of date, you can't really argue with the system that, that you know, the kind of representation of nature, because that definitely it, it does hold the wisdom that we do need to move forward. And there's no reason why that can't be done in a very modern way, you know. Um, yeah. So, so I, I do. I, well, I do hope that they start looking back into that uh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, also on the subject of water, um, I mean, clean water, as you mentioned, and, and like clean, you know, food, clean air, clean water, these things that we all have, you know, rights to as human beings are just something we should all have access to. And quite sadly, they're becoming more scarce. Um, and clean water in particular is becoming way more scarce than it's ever been, which is a big concern. I, I was reading in your book, um, there's a, a, a sewage system which looked very interesting. Um, it uses no chemicals, it uses no energy, and it's also used yeah. to. Oh, I think you said produce food as well. How does that work exactly? Yeah, it's it's probably, you know, one of the most applicable systems to cities because it's actually located on the periphery of a city. It's um, it's on the edges of Calcutta and it's this huge wastewater aquaculture treatment system that kind of like happened by mistake. Um, a farmer accidentally one day let river water that was polluted with sewage, so the legend goes, into his aquaculture ponds and he found that the water, rather than killing all his fish, it doubled his yield. And then other farmers started doing the same thing and, you know, this system's been around for about a hundred years and as the city of Calcutta has expanded, which is, it, it's exploded 400% in the last 40 years or something, so is this system expanded to accommodate all that growth of wastewater. And so what happens is the wastewater from the city, from the core of Calcutta, goes into the Hooghly River, it goes downstream, it gets siphoned into this huge wetland that's been adapted with these fish ponds. And it goes into a treat primary treatment where, you know, sunshine and sewage and this amazing kind of chemical process of energy between algae and bacteria, it breaks down all the waste. And then it, the water after it's sort of first treated then moves into these aquaculture ponds of 300 fish ponds, which then supply the fish with food and the fish fit, you know, they supply the city of Calcutta with about 20% of its fish. The water as it's cleaned is used for irrigation for rice and for vegetables that are grown that are then sold back to the city again. You know, there's no transportation costs to get the water there. There's no coal power, you know, treatment systems. 
It's this haven for bird life and for biodiversity, and it provides, they think, about approximately 100,000 jobs to the residents of the sea. So it's just this incredible, biodiverse, organic, clean system of treating waste that is just in complete opposite, polar opposites to the way we think about industrial wastewater treatment, that it's just mind boggling. Um, and then after it goes through that system, it, co it goes out relatively clean and then enters the Bay of Bengal and then goes back into the sea, probably to be taken up once again without sort of killing all the wildlife downstream and nutrient load loading and causing all those terrible algal blooms. So it's, it's a new system as well, you know, it evolved a hundred years ago. It's, it's different to a lot of the systems, which some of them are six and a half thousand years old, but it's amazing. It started to be replicated, but what's really weird is the city doesn't pay for it. So the tax dollar doesn't pay for it. Um, and the system is now threatened by developers who want to develop, fill in the wet, wetland, which is super traditional way of cities expanding. They fill in their wetlands. For, for land to build houses so they can tax people. So it's kind of this like this thinking which is like economically driven, super short term without understanding like the much larger free natural benefits to the city. That's kind of like, that's actually like in play right now. But it's this incredible um, system on the edges of Calcutta. Wow, that sounds incredible. I mean, everything you've just described there sounds almost too good to be true. I mean, if they're if they've got hey, that together, I know, like <laughs> I'm like, they've, like, they've worked like it all out. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. And the, okay, so they've got this, and then instead of trying to actually invest in this, and 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 yeah. it's good, it's good for the planet, it's good for the economy, it's good for the people. It's pretty much ticking all the boxes. Yet they're looking at the dollar signs again and going, okay, let's build some luxury apartments there or whatever. So a few people can profit. Yeah. It's, I think that's just, it, all, it, it always seems to come back to this, doesn't it? The root of all evil seems to be, you know, a few people at the top wanting to try and make as much money for themselves as possible. So I guess greed gets in the way of these things. And that's one thing that seems to keep stopping us from moving forward, you know? And I, I don't know whether that's the capitalist system or just human beings in general have a tendency to sort of, you know, look after themselves and the people at the top generally who have the power are the greediest or whatever. But it's such a shame to hear that, that they've developed this system. I mean, they should be showcasing this and modernizing this. And, yeah. and they, that, you know, that I think there's probably a lot of, you know, people that would want to look into this and develop this within yeah. their own towns and cities and communities. It sounds incredible. Yeah, yeah. It, has, it is actually being replicated in France and Germany and some Asian cities right now. And that's the even more confusing thing is it's being replicated. The science is really incredible. It's just that, and, and I think it's, the same for a lot of people, when it's in your own backyard um, and you kind of have brought up probably people who live near are like, oh, it's smelly, it's this, it's that. Like there's all these weird biases. And I mean, universally, there's this complete lack of recognition about these greener than green, I would say, technologies. So part of, I think the book was really to say like, if we put this on an international global platform and this gets actually recognized, that could have a huge impact on, especially for the East Calcutta wetlands, saving it and protecting it. And so that was also like part of the reason why I wrote the book, because these systems, you know, they're really threatened. And we always talk about animals being threatened and, and biodiversity being like, you know, the 21st century its greatest loss and I keep on saying but wait like that biodiversity is there because of the technologies of local communities and these incredible nature-based systems so it's not actually just the biodiversity that's going to be the loss I, I really feel like the 21st century's greatest loss is going to be technologies that we didn't even think was technology yet which kind of like blows my mind in so many different ways because we can imagine like just the same way we have climate change. We're like, oh, all those things we did wrong. Like imagine next century when everyone's going to be like, what were they thinking? Like what, were, what was going on in people's heads where they just erased all these thousands of years of knowledge and wisdom um, for like, you know, short term economic gain. 
So yeah, there's a lot to learn. Wow. Yeah, I guess it's like, as you sort of mentioned, it's and, and also within those cultures, they might not see the value in it themselves. Like, like for example, we, we did, we've done a lot of work in here in Bali, working with craftspeople and, and, um, we've built Katamama hotel and, and one of the, um, sort of mission with the hotel was to really kind of shine a light on Indonesian craftsmanship. And we visit a lot of the villages and it was, it was quite clearly becoming a bit of a dying, dying art form. Like a lot, especially the younger generation, even though that, even though it still exists in daily life here, the younger generation were a bit hesitant. They're like, oh, I don't really want to go and be a carpenter, a, a carver, or I don't want to do the looming anymore. It takes too much time. And they'd rather go and work in a mobile phone shop or whatever. And they see that as being a, a sort of higher stature for them to be working in a modern electronic store rather than actually sort of making something by hand. So with Katamama, we really wanted to sort of shine a light on the makers and show the value and actually what these skills that you have is so valuable. If you had that skill set and you were living in, I don't know, New York, it would be a tremendously, you know, profitable thing, you know, you know because people are looking a bit more deeply into this now and, and you would probably be one of maybe 10 people in the whole uh, city yeah. that could even do that. So how valuable and how, how skillful is that? But unfortunately, a lot of people just can't see that. They, they've sort of been blinded by the Western philosophy of, you know, new technology, new ways of doing things, and they've kind of lost, losing that sight a little bit. It's almost kind of like a fish in water. You kind of can't really see the water that you're in until all of a sudden it's gone, and then you realize, oh, actually, it was a lot better doing it that way. You know, maybe the land the land that I had before was a lot better than what I'm building now or whatever. So I think, yeah, I think creating, like, the visibility of value, just sort of putting that back to the forefront of saying what you have is very valuable. Please do not let this go. So I guess it's kind of like, you know, the, obviously, clearly, it's one of the, the missions that you're on now is really trying to shine a light on this and sort of reminding the people of what they have. And then also to the to the more kind of modern world, don't lose this wisdom, you know. So, yeah, I think it's incredibly important work that you're doing. So fingers crossed it, it spreads further and hopefully some big brands are starting to sort of see, you know, what's going on and they start kind of backing it as well, you know. Um, is there any particular brands that you're working with at the moment um, on these types of thing, or have you seen like is, is there any yeah any any kind of other works that you're doing outside of the book? The brands that I can talk about, I am working with Cartier um, and working with sort of their innovation lab. Um, the work that we're doing beyond the book, I am working with um, two women. One is a journalist, and one is. Um, She's more sort of film and television uh, actress. We're looking to take the ideas of low tech and to bring that into onto the screen. And so in sort of like a documentary um, form. And um, we're also looking at, you know, always more work, always more research, always more writing. Uh, but right now there's kind of like a shift in focus to, to think about you know how big, how how quickly can we spread that word? And I think, you know, through through um, different media, that's going to be the way to sort of really make that bigger push. Um, and also as a designer, um, you know, how can we manifest these projects on the ground really quickly? And so consulting with corporations or just doing design projects. We just finished a design project here in New York City. We did the Rockefeller Center temporary summer gardens. And we sort of brought back all these um, native American meadow species and planted all those into the Rockefeller Center campus. And it just looks so vastly different to the types of plantings. And that's kind of like probably one of the most obvious ways that you can bring back these types of ideas into a super urban landscape that's really fully formed and constructed is by bringing back indigenous vegetation to then bring back indigenous um, pollinators and insects and other species and so you know I think the biggest push is to really on the ground start manifesting these projects in space um, and in different landscapes. Are you guys still in lockdown or is the are you allowed to travel yet or how's the situation over there? Yeah well gyms are opening so that's good um, next week I don't know if I'm gonna be going to the gym <laughs> but we can travel although most people don't want us but luckily I've got an Aussie passport. No, um, we're, my partner and I, we're actually gonna be going to Europe 
beginning of October to lecture around Europe and to teach a little bit over there. Uh, and um, but I think we can. I think Americans can go to like Croatia, and that's it, kind of <laughs> right now. Um, yeah, no one wants us. Isn't it funny how the American passport and the UK passport are now the sort of worst ones to have? <laughs> I know, I was like, no. How, how fast things have changed. <laughs> they used to be the best. And now, now, like, we're getting kicked out of uh, Europe. Yeah. America is just, yeah, it's, basically, like, it's basically the end guys, of America. Like, <laughs> how the world is changing, huh? Yeah, they're like, you guys did such a crap job. <laughs> you can stay exactly where you are. We have Trump and <laughs> Boris, yay. <laughs> They kind of look alike. It's weird. I, I, I'm really not comfortable with it. <laughs> no, it's, um, yeah, I guess, you know what? Sometimes you have to hit an all time low for things to start changing. Yeah, and, I, right. and I believe. And build yourself back up. I, yeah, I believe the, use, the uselessness of Boris and Trump, you know, as chaotic and as bad it is for everybody that's living there and, or everywhere around the world, hopefully it will actually make people wake up and realize this is not how we want to live and we'll see right? some. We'll see some positive. It gives yeah. us a chance to rethink um, amongst the chaos. Yeah. So hopefully we can come out of this and build some better ways of doing things. Yeah, I think sadly the UK has got Boris for a little bit longer than we might have Trump. So maybe, maybe we'll be inspiring the 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 Brits to like. I'm an American now, which is why I keep on saying we. So I'm like dual citizenship. Um, so maybe I don't know. Following that way, it seemed like you know. Boris followed in the wake of Trump, so I'm like, it's really on the US to like shake things up right now because so many global leaders just like, you know, have such adoration for him and, you know, the rest of his, the country that he actually leads is just so disgusted by him. So hopefully we're going to, you know, have a huge swing and be able to, to shift the trajectory of America and like, you know, a lot of other terrible political regimes. Yeah, I mean, right now we need we need good leadership, you know, to get us out of this, and um, he's definitely not the right the right the right one. But oh. think, fingers crossed, we can. Yeah, and um, just on a final note, Judy, it's been it's been great catching up. I uh, appreciate you coming on. Just on a final note, just a woman of your wisdom, you know, your knowledge and and work. Um, what advice could you give for any you know the youth of today or any upcoming designers that are sort of um, trying to make it in today's world? Any any bits of advice you could give? Yeah, I mean, I think that designers, in a way, kind of have been sold this same myth that there are, you know, the best ways of designing and they're, they're coming out of... And I, I was completely guilty of falling for this, that, you know, I came to America to study because I was like, oh, wow, like, the US, that's where all the great work is coming out of, that's like the most forward-thinking designs you know products and landscapes and you know a lot of the students that I teach because I, I I've taught here for the last 12 years they're from all over the world mostly not the US and they come here to like learn the best and I think that you know kind of what I teach is this like weird and and like you know different perspective that well where you come from has probably got some incredible ideas and and thinking and technology and you need to bring that to us and we need to learn from you and then you need to take some of the thinking that you learn here and then take that back as students or as designers and and sort of evolve or or adapt or change what's happening and the thinking and and the you know the 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 kind of like the the politics around innovation where you come from and to recognize and you know I think one of the one of the biggest in things is climate change is not going to happen by like this idea of the global universal and by selling these you know handful of technologies or products to the whole world for everybody to follow it's going to happen by you know, the 99% of populations, mostly in developing countries, really taking hold and saying, okay, these systems are incredibly resilient. They're local. We know how to build them. We know what to do with them. We just need some help thinking how to scale them and maybe advance them. That's going to be the way that we really have the greatest 
impact on climate change along with some of these high-tech systems because I'm not anti-high-tech I'm really fascinated by high-tech I just think we have a really closed perspective of the potential of what high-tech could be at this point in time so that's kind of like my big ask for designers and for students is to just be really proud of where you come from and really think of you know I think like you know a word that's really critical at this time is like decolonization of these ideas and of design of like don't think that because you know what is local to you and what is indigenous isn't relevant it's so relevant and it'll become more and more and more relevant you know as we kind of like move into this era of more climate change and more climate consciousness and being able to really um, affect our, our future and by looking back at our histories yeah amazing advice yeah i completely agree it's time for us all to sort of value our culture again and um yeah, thank you very much. We uh, pr appreciate it coming on. It's been great to talk to you. Um, and we'll hopefully catch up soon. Hopefully I'll see you in Bali once this whole thing calms down and we can, uh, we can maybe work on some projects together. Yeah, I would love that. Thanks so much for having me. This was great. Um, and yeah, good luck with uh, the series and all the work that you're doing as well. Yeah, likewise. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Julia. Thank okay, you. we'll speak very soon. Cheers.